just want to tell you thanks for keeping it squatchy. Ah! She's conjuring me! She's conjuring me! You're a pain in the ass, you know that? Inside the creaking door. Uh, we couldn't be more excited about the uh, panel we're going to have here tonight. And uh, we've had a chance to have um, part of this family with us many, many years here at Paragon. We've, we've come very close with the parents. Andrew, Roger, they've been coming. Andrew's been coming here for probably five, six, seven, eight years now. <laughs>
means the world to me. And all of it is because you came to see us. Thank you. Okay, I want to take just one moment. Um, you can see that there are other people on the stage with us. Um, Les Anderson uh, is an Emmy Award winning producer, documentary, documentarian, uh, a dear friend of our family, truly love him. Julie Griffin is, uh, it's not by my table, she does ghost photographs, she's got her books here too, and you can see her at our table, um, but she's also a very talented uh, writer and a wonderful author, a wonderful photographer, she captures things in photography I've never seen captured before in terms of paranormal, um, and so they both made this long, arduous trip to come here to record this so that we could share this with my mother, who can't be here with us tonight. But I've got, I've got her on speed dial, and in a few minutes we're going to call her up. I'm going to put on speakerphone, and I would love it. I would truly appreciate it if you would sing happy birthday to her, because she's going to be 80 on Saturday, and she can't be here. And we're all here, so it's a way for us to share you with her. And, uh, and then we'll all go see her the following weekend and have a big party. And also, one other thing, excuse me. <coughs> already, with the, you're already. Um, uh, I have a dear friend who came a long way to be here this weekend. Uh, he's a fabulous author in the paranormal, and this is his first time at this event. And his time is, the name is Mike Rimseeker. Uh Mike, where are you, honey? There you are, stand up, stand up. I want everybody here to pledge that you will stop by Mike's table and give us a hug and a kiss. And of course, my sister April, our sister April, is the angel on our shoulders. that happened 
that caused my mother to keep saying to my father, I want to raise my girls in the country. I want a place in the country. Um, and, you know, dads were like, you know, honey, we've been here like six years. We haven't had any equity in this house yet. How are we supposed to sell this house and go, you know, buy a farm? Uh, well, it happened. And because there was a convergence of events that occurred that catapulted us to that farmhouse. And the thing that was so interesting was that we visited a number of times. How girls we went to see Mr. Kenyon a number of times before we actually assumed ownership of the house. And none of us remember ever seeing anything weird, strange, or untoward in that farmhouse until the day we moved in. And that's one of the most important stories in the book because I walked in the house, and, and you can move down the line with this because this is fascinating. I walked in the house, Dad opened the back of the moving van. Uh, it was January 11th, 1971. Mom and Dad bought the house in uh, December of 1970, and Mom refused to move at Christmas. I can't imagine why those things would conflict. Um, but uh, we moved in in January, and Mr. Kenyon was moving out the day that we were moving in. Dad handed me a box uh, marked kitchen. Mom had already gone into the kitchen with April because she was only five. She was too young to unload the truck, but she could help Mom in the kitchen. So I walked into the house uh, through the parlor door, which was the closest door to warmth. It was freezing. We were in the middle of a swirling snowstorm. But you know, if you're a good hearty Yankee, you move. If it's moving day, you just move. And so we did, and um, I uh, went in the parlor door, I took a hard right into the dining room. Mr. Kenyon was standing at the dining room table packing some of his belongings, and I said, good morning, Mr. Kenyon. And then I noticed that there was a man standing in the corner of the room, and he looked absolutely solid to me. I, didn't, I could not distinguish him from any other human being to the extent that as I walked past him, I said, good morning, sir. And he ignored me. He looked right through me because he was fixated on watching Mr. Kenyon. Um, and I went to the kitchen and I said, Mom, who's that man with Mr. Kenyon? And she's like, there's nobody with Mr. Kenyon. His son's on the way. He's not here yet. And I was like, OK. She's like, go get me into the box. So I walked out the kitchen door. And then I do believe Christine walked in next, correct? Why don't you pick it up from here and tell the rest? Yep, I did. I walked in um, from the second front door, closest to the end of the house by the woodshed. So I came in the front door and came around the corner, and there was some packing and stuff going on in the front room. And there's this guy, and he is just got his arms crossed and his leg crossed, and he was kind of kicking the floor a little bit with his foot, and um, he sure looked real enough to me. I didn't know it wasn't anybody who was not real. And um, so I did the same. I said, you know, who's that man? And my mother's like, what man? And I said, the man that's in the dining room. And she said, there's no man in the dining room. I said, yeah, there he is. He's at the door. He looked right at the door between the hallway, which was always creepy to me unbeknownst at the time that that was the entrance to the cellar door and that hallway, which um, was like the bane of my existence in that house. Um, but it was right through that hallway that um, was the entrance to go down into the cellar. And um, I, I saw him many, many times over the years that we lived there. He was all over that house. He was all the time, but he was not scary. He was not anybody who was threatening. He didn't bother me in the least. I just got to where I just expected to see him around the house after a few years, and it didn't bother me anymore, but it was a strange first circumstance for your first day in the house, let's say, as a kid. So um, the next, I guess, was Cindy saw him next, I think. Or Nancy, I don't know. Yeah, no, it was Cindy. Okay. It was Cindy and then Nancy. So I saw him standing in the kitchen. I walked in the kitchen door. He was standing in the kitchen. And I didn't pay any attention to him at all until later on that afternoon when I asked Mom once again, who was that man in the kitchen? She said, I don't know what the girls were talking about. I saw him in the middle of that room and also in the dining room several times the first day that we moved in. And he just looked at me and I said hello to him and so I just walked away and kept walking and I asked my mom where he had gone and she said that nobody had been there. I said, where is Mr. Kenyon's friend? Did he leave? And she said, 
there was no Mr. Kenyon's friend here, she said. And that was the last I saw of them, just that first day. Well, Nancy walked into the kitchen um, a little later and she leaned over to Cindy and she said, did you see that man with Mr. Kenyon? I did, and he just disappeared. And that was our introduction to the paranormal world. Robert, you're moving in. Yeah, well, I didn't see all of this because I was in the truck. <laughs> but, but Mr. Kenyon gave you kind of a foreboding warning. When you're moving into the house, house, because after I finished unloading the truck and went into the house, they came to me and said, I need to talk to you. They says, come on. And we went out on the porch. And he looked at me and he says, for the sake of your family, Roger, uh, please leave the lights on in this house at night. And I, not knowing what he was talking about, I just said, yeah, okay, no problem, sir. And that was it. And uh, I left the lights on for a while, anyway, uh, until all the stuff started to happen. So that was part of my, my end of it. So. Well, I think that at the time you had talked about that, and, and when I wrote the books, I, when I interviewed you about that, you had said that you thought that uh, you, you didn't know how to interpret his statement for the sake of your family, leave the lights on at night. And, but it wasn't until we'd been there for several months that we started to get to know people in the area. And if we subsequently discovered that all of them said it didn't matter what time of night they drove past that farmhouse, every light in that house was on, that it lit up the dark landscape like a Christmas tree. Um, and we determined, just talking about this, that we thought perhaps that is how Mr. Kenyon kept activity in the house at bay, um, or at least could see what was coming. Uh, but over, you know, people said that it had lived there for many decades, uh, that there was never a time at night that every light in that house wasn't on all night long. Um, and, um, you know, Mr. Kenyon didn't really uh, divulge very much, did he, about this. One time he said to Mom, uh, when she asked him about strange noises in the, in the parlor, and he said, he just patted her on the hand, and he said, swallows in the chimney, my dear, swallows in the chimney. It was just easier to not, you know, this was a taboo subject way more than it is now, back in the early 70s. This was just not something people talked about. You know, so it was, uh, it was his way, I think, of trying to tell you and mom that there was some kind of stuff going on in the house. But he also insisted, didn't he, that this was the best place that you could possibly raise a family. Well, yes, because he used to come down once, twice, three times a week. Yeah. And uh, he'd, uh, he'd say, Roger, let's go for a walk, and then we'd go out in the woods and be on the, the pond and go up on the, where the, there was a state marker for, because the, the farm was half in Massachusetts and half in Rhode Island. And he would talk about it, and he would cry about his wife. That was so bad to him. He would talk, we would go to this big rock out in the back, and he would talk about how he used to climb on the back of it and get on top and sit there and hold hands with him. Unbelievable. And uh, then he told me that his wife had passed away in the house, and I know that's why he did not want to leave. And I offered him a home, a home to stay in. I was going to give him a room to himself, but he thought it was time to leave, so his son had built a house for him in the country, down in the town, and he moved, and that was it. But uh, it's very sad, very sad. Well, his son had already built the house, and you know, I mean, I'll never forget the day that you offered for him to move in. You said, Earl, this house is plenty big enough. We all love you. I remember, and the thing that was so remarkable about that is while you were having that conversation with Earl Kenyon at the dining room table, the apparition that Nancy named Manny because she couldn't think of anything else because he was a man. Um, 
she wasn't that creative. She's a lot more creative now, trust me when I tell you. Um, but, uh, you know, and the thing that was interesting was uh, the four of us that you see sitting at this table and on this panel right now were all in that room at the same time that Dad was asking Mr. Kenyon if he would like to just spend the rest of his life with us. And Manny, for lack of a better name, uh, reappeared and all four of us saw him, but Dad and Mr. Kenyon didn't. And that's the first time that something went click. We're in a different kind of a place here than we've ever been, ever. And we all kind of looked at each other, just kind of glanced at each other, like, do you see him? Why don't they see him? You know, but we didn't say anything about it. Um, and, you know, I want Cindy to talk to you. Uh, we, we, we didn't even say anything to, about it to our parents, but we did talk amongst ourselves, didn't we? And we'll visit that in just a couple of moments. But before my mother falls asleep, she's having an affair with Einstein. I gave her a really great book about Einstein, and she can't pull herself away from it. And so if I don't catch her now, we're not going to catch her because she's going to bed with Einstein. You know, not for nothing, but I think I better call a rock star. <laughs> she's totally Alexa. She's totally I hope she answers. <laughs> Might not. See, that was a joke. It was a joke. <laughs> sort of. I raised a few jokes just Hello, Mother. Hello, darling. How are you? I'm good. I have a wonderful day today. Not too much pain. And nice weather and complaints. Oh, that's wonderful, sweetheart. Uh, listen, there's like a few, I don't know how many hundreds, thousands of people here that have a message for you, Carolyn. Um, and I will just let them deliver it. Someone was going to slap it in the face. It would 
throw its head back and roll its eyes in the back of his head and just shudder and shudder and it would get colder and the smell would increase to the point where I just had to remove the horse from the barn. I just tell him it's okay, calm him down and bring him out and put him in the paddock because he was all of the animals. It wasn't just the horses, it was the dogs as well. We had a Dalmatian that wouldn't go through the hallway from the dining room into the kitchen, which was the place where it, could, it went up to my bedroom, which had a lot of activity, and it was also the cellar door. And I got very upset with the dog one day, and I said, come on, this is ridiculous. Let's just, we would hold steaks in the kitchen, and that dog would not go through that hallway. So I picked him up one day, and I said, come on, we're going through. Well, he just started to shake and whine and he peed all over me. We also had another dog, a black dog, we called him Psych. He would try to climb up the chimney as if he was after something. And I was sitting in the living room one day, my mom's friend was also sitting there, and a beam of light came down the chimney and crossed across the room and landed in this woman's lap. About two minutes later, another beam of light came down the chimney, crossed across the room, and landed in this woman's lap. Well, the woman ended up dying of stomach cancer, and I thought that was pretty significant after seeing those lights land in her gut. It, a lot went on outside the house. I was doing my homework, and all of a sudden something came over me. It just it made me put my homework down. It's like I had absolutely no control of it, and I started walking into the woods. And I didn't know where I was going, and it just led me through this field and through like a pine grove, and I continued to walk, and then something made me just stop. And I looked down, and there was an open well, and there was a dead bunny inside the well. But it wasn't a it wasn't a wild bunny, it was one of our bunnies. And it's like someone led me out there. And yeah, I, I believe it was your bunny, wasn't it? It was one of the many. We had we had several bunnies. And they lot they breed a lot. Very yeah, violent bunnies. ways. Mom told us that she was finding good homes for all of them, but then suddenly she had these stew recipes that she was trying out. <laughs> Eventually we caught her. Cape houses, they have 
real small recessed windows on the second floor. And um, I would just be in there either doing laundry or doing homework or not cleaning <laughs> like I was supposed to be. Um, and I would just hear um, this little girl crying or a little child crying. And it was, I wasn't sure I heard it and it would be one of those things where you strain and so hard to hear. And it was just like this, oh my God, this child is just weeping and weeping and weeping. And it, um, I would hear it sometimes and I would think it sounds like, this sounds like that's coming from outside. So I'm dragging up a stool to climb up to the window so I can look out the window and see what I'm hearing going on outside. And then I can hear it and then I'm turning because it's behind me, it's not out there, it's in here with me. And um, then it would just kind of fade away and I would just go about my business like, okay, I must have been dreaming that. Maybe I fell asleep doing homework or something, I don't know. And then I started hearing that on a regular, regular basis. And um, I determined that it was a, a young girl. It just, there was just a slightly girl feminine quality to it. And it was just so freaking heartbreaking. This little child just wailing, wailing, wailing. And it kind of sounded like mama, like mama kind of thing. And uh, we found out just, I don't know, maybe two years ago or three years ago, that there was a little girl that was murdered in that house. And, and it was bad. It was, she was not only murdered, but she was beaten, raped, and strangled, I believe. That was Prudence Arnold's bed. But actually, what happened to her didn't happen at the farmhouse, but that was her home. Her mother and father had both died. And then she went to live um, in Uxbridge, Mass, which was still part of Rhode Island at the time, mm -hmm. at the Richardson farm, because of course the Richardsons intermarried with the Arnolds, and that's how it went from being built by the Richardsons to becoming the Arnold estate. And so the murder didn't actually happen in the house. It happened at the Richard estate in Uxbridge, but that was her home. Yeah. And that's where she had lived her whole life prior to her parents' death. And so I think that, you know, we'll never know. For None sure. of them ever walked up to us and said, hello, my name is. So, you know, we're never going to know every, you know, all the minutia of the history of the And it could have been of the Oliver that April saw. Yes, yeah, people used little to little tell her stories Oliver. about the little boy Oliver who used to approach her all the time and try to speak with her or try to speak. Um, yeah. But it, it could very well have been that child too. It was just it just became part of living there. Um, it, it wasn't always it wasn't every day. It wasn't even every month. But when it was, it it was, and it made itself very um, patently obvious that we were way not alone. The only people living in that house at all. Uh, in 1996, um, I had uh, come down to Georgia, and Cindy and I decided to make a trip up to see Nancy. Uh, Nancy and Cindy are thick as thieves. Uh, if you see them together, just be careful because they're up to something. And um, so we went up and, and we stayed with Nancy, and I took care of Nancy's kids so that Cindy and Nancy could go up to the farmhouse for a visit because neither of them had been there since 1980 when we had moved. And one of the most intense and really one of the most beautiful things that ever happened to any of us happened on their visit. And I would deeply appreciate it if they would tell that story. I know it's hard to tell, but reach down and tell what happened when you and Cindy went back to that farmhouse. Yes. Cindy and I decided that we were going to go back to the farmhouse and Annie decided, because it was Halloween, that she was going to watch the children instead of coming with us. Cindy and I both determined that she was chicken shit. <laughs> and Someone had so she sense. watched my children and Cindy and I went up to the house. Um, we entered the house through the woodshed and we walked into what was my mother's bedroom. It was also known as a summer kitchen. As soon as we entered that room, we were put in this, to me it felt like it was, in, you were inside a balloon and the balloon was blowing up around you and you 
could feel the pressure just pushing in on you. And I, I just stood there and I was almost like in shock and I'm thinking, how the hell am I going to explain this to Cindy? What is going on here? And all of a sudden something started touching my face very, very softly and touching my hair. And it, it was shocking to me and I could hear my sister standing next, she was standing right next to me. I could hear her, but for some reason I couldn't see her. And I felt like I was in this bubble all by myself. And I could hear the woman who owned the house and she's saying, something's happening to you right now. And I was embarrassed, so I said no. But I could hear Cindy say yes. And we continued on with the tour of the house. The woman took us around, I went up to my old bedroom and and we visited and she asked us a few questions and we, we talked to her. She, she brought up the fact that there was activity in the house. So we clarified some details for her. And all this time I'm thinking, how am I gonna tell Cindy about this? Well, we leave the house, we get out to the barn where our car was parked. Cindy turns around to me, looks at me, she says, did you feel that fucking barrier feel? <laughs> And we walked down to the river and the lake and we, we revisited and we got back up and we got in the vehicle and Cindy just looked at me and she said, we actually started driving down the road and she looked and she said, did they say anything to you or did you hear anything? I said, yes, inside my head something kept saying, oh my God, it's you, you're back. And we got so shaken up by it that we pulled the van over to the side of the road and we kind of got emotional and cried a little bit. And I, we had decided that we were not going to talk to Mrs. Sutcliffe about it or tell her we had experienced anything if we did in the house. So I said to Cindy, I, saw, I said, you told Mrs. Sutcliffe. And she said, no, I didn't. I said, yes, you did. I heard you. She said, I wasn't talking to her. She was responding to what the spirit was saying. Oh my God, it's you, you're back. And Cindy was saying, yes. It, it was an amazing, I'll never forget it as long as I live. What it feels like to have something touching you when you can't see it. And I thought that possibly they put us in that bubble to welcome us and to make us, she, Cindy thinks it was to protect us from the evil that was the one spirit in the house that was so evil. I thought, I felt very welcomed and very loved and very welcomed back to the home. And that's about it. <laughs> Cindy, is there anything you want to add to it? <laughs> All right, due, due to time, I want to uh, get into another part of your life in the farmhouse. So you said you moved in in 71, okay? The move to California is, is simply based on the case files of Ed Lorraine Warren. At what point did the Warrens get involved? What was the year and how did they show up? What happened? Well, in uh, August of 1973, so we'd already been there like two and a half years, a little more, a um, uh, van load of teenagers pulled into the yard. Dad was getting ready to leave for a trip. Mom's like, you know, Roger, who's this? Go handle that. And he's like, I gotta go. You handle it. You know, he figured they were friends of mine from school. And, um, and we weren't there yet. But uh, uh, they, I didn't know that they were there yet, is what I'm trying to say. And so um, Dad left on his business trip and uh, Nancy, this is so funny, uh, one of them, Keith Johnson, gets out of the van and he had long blonde hair and he was wearing kind of a cream colored tunic and Nancy comes terrorizing into the house. She says, Mom, Jesus Christ is here! <laughs> Well, 
we had some pretty intense stuff happen that day with Keith, Keith Johnson in the house and, uh, and his crew, Pyro, from Rhode Island College. And then uh, he was so uh, blown away by what happened. Um, and he said uh, to my mother, you know, you called me to, to come. And she said, no, I never called anybody. We've never talked to anybody about this, what's going on in the house. He said, no, but I recognize your voice. You called me and asked me to come to the house, and she said, no, dear. And to this day, my mother, 80 years old, or shortly, um, is still as sharp as a tack, and she swears she never asked anybody to come to the house and did not discuss this outside of our own family and close circle of friends. But something called Keith Johnson to that house and used my mother's voice to do it. And um, their experience was so intense that they're the ones that sought out Ed and Lorraine Warren. They went to a seminar that they were giving at the University of Rhode Island, and they brought our predicament to their attention. And it was on um, the night before Halloween that Ed and Lorraine showed up at our door after dark. Um, my mother let them in. It was freezing cold. Uh, she was a gracious host. They walked in the house. My mom had no idea who they were. She thought they were a couple that had gotten lost out in the woods. And uh, let them in to warm up, and they introduced themselves, and Lorraine Warren walked over to our big black stove in the kitchen, and she covered her, her head and put her hand on it, and she said, I sense a malignant presence in this house. Her name is Bathsheba. And from that moment on, Everything that happened in the house that Mrs. Warren found out about, she blamed on Bathsheba. But we feel absolutely certain that the spirit that was haunting and taunting my mother was long dead before Bathsheba was even born, and that she got a really bad rap because Mrs. Warren said that it was her. Uh, but what actually was happening in that house, Bathsheba never lived in that house. She was um, not of the Arnold clan. She was not related to the Richardsons. She was actually born. She was Sherman. She was, a, but she was born of the Thayer and the Taft family, two very prominent families associated with the building of Brown University in Providence. And she lived about, as the crow flies, about a mile away, wouldn't you say? Um, well, that was what the Warrens decided and put into their files was that Bathsheba Sherman was responsible for everything bad that happened in the house, hence the conjuring. Um, but that really wasn't the truth of the matter. And they only came five times between October of uh, 1973 and August of 1974. And that's when my father, after a seance that went so badly wrong, it almost killed my mother. My father uh, unceremoniously threw them out of the house. They came back uh, about a month or six weeks later just to check and make sure that mom was still alive because when they left that night, they didn't know if she had survived or not. She was unconscious in the middle of our parlor floor and my father was tending to her. And when he tried to run to her side, Ed Warren had grabbed his arm and my father turned around and pole cocked him and took a man twice his size to the floor and broke his nose. So it's probably never a good idea to try to keep Rob and Karen from anybody who loves. <laughs> so that was what they had to take five or six times. They knew nothing. And it was funny because when I talked to Mrs. Warren at the, uh, uh, just before the premiere, Cindy and I went out to California uh, at the uh, behest of um, Warner Brothers for a sneak preview of the film. Uh, three months before it opened, and that was when we had that conversation, remember, Cindy, with Mrs. Warren, and she said, you know, I thought that if we went on, on uh, the eve of Halloween that the veil would be thinnest and we'd have the best chance of having an experience. And Mom said, when I told her that, she said, well, but I guess every day was Halloween at the farm. You know, it didn't matter. It just didn't matter. Day or night, it didn't matter. There was anything could happen any time. And in fact, Cindy had said that was the thing that always scared her the most, was just not knowing what was going to happen next. Yeah. So you, you and Cindy walked in walk on, on, but eavesdropped on a seance. You write about this in your books. 
you take us a little bit more into that? Because that was that was not something the family had planned with the warrants. No. No, when they showed up, Dad didn't want any part of it. He just didn't want to hear it. He never really trusted them. He thought that they were trying to exploit, exploit our family. Mom did feel uh, more of a sense of uh, kinship with Lorraine and, you know, finally had somebody that she could talk to that believed her and believed us, you know. Remember when Ed um, had done extensive interviews with all of us and April wouldn't tell them anything about her little friend Oliver because she was afraid that they had the kind of power that they could make him go away and she loved him so she wouldn't tell them that he even existed. Um, but the, the others of us, you know, talked pretty openly with them about what we had experienced in the house. And it was, um, it was just really odd because I, I really do believe that they wanted to help us. I really do. But Mrs. Warren, when Cindy and I were with her out in California in 2013, she said, uh, Ed and I were over our heads the minute we crossed the threshold of your farm. We just didn't know it. And so they posted this seance on our family and poor Cindy. Cindy, why don't you pick this up? I don't want to do all the talking. You were there too and you had an incredible experience. Go, go, go. No. Go, go, go. Really? Fine. Okay, fine. You all fine. Well, she was like getting ready to pass out in my arms because I was holding her. We were standing in the front foyer and I was holding her and she's becoming dead weight in my arms because it was so frightening. I mean, Cindy, if I say something wrong, you, you, you know, clarify. I love it. Um, but, uh, yeah, um, they had um, kind of forced, well, this is why I made a really critical error in judgment, and she said to my father, Roger, if you love your wife, you'll let us do this. Well, he had to be removed from the room by Ed Warren and the priest that they had brought. That was not the kind of thing that you should say to my father. And um, what saved her life was that she was a woman, I think, actually. Um, but they, they talked. <laughs> they, you know, finally talked them into doing this, and they told Nancy, you weren't home, you were with Katie that night. But the rest of us were. And they brought a um, medium with them named Mary Pastorella. And, you know, I've, you've heard me say it before. I consider what happened in our home that night spiritual malpractice. You do not, in a house that's full of children, kick open wide the doors to the nether world and invite everything in so that you can determine the culprit in the house. And that is exactly what happened. And they start, she started doing her conjuring. That's where the name of the movie came from, with her, you know, a little crystals and her stuff. And there were candles on the table, and the table started. As soon as she started, the priest jumped up away from the table and put himself in the corner, and the table started lifting up off the floor. And then as if the hand of God came down on it, boom, right in the middle of the table. All the candles flew out, everything stopped. Um, there's still four imprints from the feet of the table in the floor, the wood floor. I was just there a few weeks ago. They're still there. They've never been sanded out. Um, her chair began to lift. She began to curl her body up into a captain's chair with arms on the side and had to weigh at least 30 pounds when you say those chairs rock and ankle. And it, she started to lift up, lift up, lift up. Her body starts curling into a ball to the extent that you would expect to hear her bones snapping. She began howling and screaming and writhing in pain and then speaking in a language that does not exist on this planet. And then in a split second, she was thrown in the chair from the middle of our dining room into the middle of our parlor. And everyone that was present in that house heard my mother's skull hit that floor. And every one of us thought she was gone. We had just watched her die. And it was my father running to her side and Ed trying to stop him that precipitated the violence that happened in our house that night. And then he threw them out and Lorraine told the cinematographers to go down into the cellar and get their equipment, much like what you see here, only the big, huge state-of-the-art for the time. And the two men that were the cinematographers uh, came uh, flying back up the cellar stairs and crying, both of them sobbing, because their very expensive camera equipment 
had been smashed into a billion pieces all over the cellar and was irretrievable and uh, irreparable. They went flying out to the van. Uh, Mary Pastorella had passed out unconscious on the table. Mr. and Mrs. Warren, with Ed holding his nose, bleeding, um, took her by one arm and Lorraine by the other, and Dad told them to get out and used some lovely, colorful language. Uh, I won't repeat it, Dad. Uh, no hands, Dad. No, no hands. Yeah. six weeks later just to make sure that mom was still alive. And then that was the last they ever came to the house, but we lived there another seven years. Uh, you know, and so there were many things that happened in the house that they never even knew about. But, you know, all the films, uh, the series, was based on the case files of Ed Lorraine Warren. Uh, they, the screenwriters, to their credit, tried to integrate some of my true story into the film uh, screenplay and Warner Brothers rejected it and they said what's the point of making a movie that nobody stays to watch because they run screaming from the theater. So The Conjuring is a predominantly fictionalized version of events literally conjured in the minds of two screenwriters who cherry picked the uh, Warren files and who cherry picked House of Darkness, House of Light and created their own screenplay, their own third story. However, we have a three movie deal um, with Hollywood and, uh, and uh, we will be telling the truth because you know what? You can't handle the truth and it's time to tell the world the truth and there's no more fictionalizing in this story ever again and that's what we're working on now. So uh, I, uh, we're going to do a little Kickstarter campaign shortly so that I can afford to uh, uh, pay my uh, screenwriter who's um, writing, taking my screenwriting, my version of the three books and turning it into an official, official Hollywood screenplay. Uh, so I'll let y'all know about that when it starts. I mean, you know, a buck or two if you want to be a part of filmmaking, paranormal filmmaking history, please feel free to contribute so I can pay the wonderful man that's doing this for me because I'm damn tired of writing, I've got to tell you. <laughs> You know, and uh, oh, also the book I promised you last year, it's here. I'm premiering it at the dinner. Come see it at the table. Remember, I'm going to have maybe 1,000 questions, so I guess we'll all have to go back next year. There you go, you got it. Part two, absolutely. Andrea, it's like you're in my head because you, you answered my last two questions without me even asking them. I wanted to know how The Conjuring actually compared to the real story and then what you guys had for the future. You just explained it all. So, ladies and gentlemen, let's please hear it for the Perry family.